Today's video is a segment from 3rd Adam Ford, The Road to Shambhala, which is available now for free on YouTube. Now in this segment, I want to speak to you about the process of mystery religion. We understand what this is, but how do they operate if they were to come together, maybe in a congregational setting, and the rituals that they would do, what does that look like? Well, after comparing and contrasting all the different religions of the world, we've boiled it down to just these points. Now, it does not matter if you are an occultist or you're a Hindu, Buddhist, New Ager, Druid, Pagan, Sufi, or a Gnostic. They all basically did the same thing and still do the same thing. Matter of fact, you will find, if you look hard enough, that the Knights Templar basically used this same format that we're giving you now. And this is the process by which they achieve their spiritual goals. And I want to give you a seven-point list that will explain all of this to you. So let's break this down for just a moment. The first thing that they would do in a mystery religion setting is they would come together and they would play a mantra. Now, if you'll remember, all of the occult is based on frequency and vibrations. And so a mantra is a sound that resonates with certain frequencies and it resonates with certain vibrations. And you're trying to interact with a spirit force and so this mantra or this sound, this frequency, this vibration creates a response in this energy force. Now, I'm sure that you have probably seen this before, but there are these videos of these Buddhist monks that are sitting with their legs crossed and their hands on their knees and they're humming a tone that sounds something like Om or something of that nature. That is actually called the Om. It is a tone that hits a certain frequency that they believe God exists in that frequency. Sound is like a home, and you can feel the vibration in near. You can put hand here. Yeah. When you touch, you feel it's like an electric spark. Matter of fact, if we go all the way back to the first Third Adam documentary, there is a purple symbol at the very top, which we have written right here for everybody to see, and that is actually the Hindu symbol for the word Om, which is the God frequency. Now, let me do this. Let me connect a few pieces together for you and make a leap from the Eastern world to the Western world. Mystery religion takes many different forms and has many different names, and that's really one of the main reasons why it is so difficult to spot. But I want you to know this and drive this deep into your soul. Roman Catholicism is a mystery religion. There's no question in my mind I have proven that over and over again. I prove it from the Bible, I prove it from history, and I prove it by their own teachings. These people are not Christians. Popery is a damnable heresy, and it is a piece of this large mystery religion. Now, I want you to know that in the Eastern world, the Hindu people would ring bells as they would walk into their temples, and really, bell usage is a part of Buddhism and Hinduism. It has been for a very long time just like the bowls that we just showed you, that these bells and bowls are designed to ring out a frequency. And that frequency brings positive vibes, wards off negative energy, which is occultism. Let's take that same principle and let's overlay that onto Romanism. Guys, I want to tell you, the reason that there are bells on the top of churches 
is the identical reason why Hindu temples have bells. Now, I know that many North American churches have these bells on top of them, and really they don't mean anything by it, but let's go back all the way into history. Let's go back to the reason why these things even exist to begin with on churches. It's not in the Bible. So where did it come from? Well, what it was is that the Eastern mystics and the Western mystics are basically practicing the same religion, and the reason that they put these things on top of churches is to ward away bad spirits with the vibration and frequency of that tone. The Hindu bowls that they use are the same as the Catholic bells. Bowls and bells accomplish the same purpose, and that is to create a frequency that eradicates bad energy and brings in good energy. And just like the Om, where they sit there and moan that tone, the same thing, the exact same practice is used with something called Gregorian hymns. And you'll see these men that were in these monasteries, they were practicing mystery religion, they were friars or priests or whatever, they would sing these songs that had a very deep throaty noise to them and they would get inside these monasteries that had a strong echo and they would make these tones and these vibrations because the ether, the quintessence, the spirit energy that they were working with reacted well to this. That's why Gregorian hymns exist. Catholicism and Hinduism and occultism are ultimately the same thing practiced in different cultures with different groups of people in different languages, but ultimately they're practicing the same thing. The bells of Catholicism are the bowls of Hinduism, and the chants and the Gregorian hymns of Romanism are the alms of Hinduism. Why is this so similar? It's because they're the same religion. They are the same religion, maybe practiced in a different culture with different language, and maybe in different eras of time, but ultimately it is a mystery religion based on frequency, vibration, and the bells and the bowls, and the alms and the Gregorian hymns are designed to do the same thing, excite this spirit energy and raise the vibration of the person who's practicing these rituals. Roman Catholicism is a mystery cult. No question. One of the things that we do is when people come to us and they want for me to be able to pray with them at some point, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just a series of prayers, but then we also have them play chant in the, at a very low level where they can just barely hear it, but we have them play it in their house all the time. And so what we've found is a lot of times that will drive the demons out, very similar to what one demon said about bells, that bells actually drive the demons out. That sound, actually the sound itself is revulsive to them and it actually drives them out of the air, drives them out of the, the location. We've found that that playing chant in a low level in the background, not only does it have a calming effect on people because, it's, uh, because of the orderliness of it as a form of music, but it also then has that effect of driving the demons out. And so a lot of times we've cleaned up houses or clean people themselves. Once they do these prayers and do that, a lot of times just get cleaned up and we don't have to see them. Another example of this, if you go watch New Age videos on YouTube, you will see that they're using an ambient music that has no meter. I think the best way to describe it is just kind of floaty. And what that's called is free time music. It has no tempo, it has no rhythm, it has no meter. And the reason they're using that is because it is a mantra. It creates a tone and a frequency so that they can go through the process of their mystery religion. And if you go look at Sufi mysticism, their actual services, they are using mantras as well. Same thing with the occult. But if you'll go check and listen to the churches that have new apostolic reformation doctrine. All of these songs begin with a mantra.
It all starts with a hmm. a tone, a frequency. And the reason that they do that is because they are trying to excite an energy force. The same energy force that the occultists work with. The same energy force that the Knights Templar work with. They're trying to excite the same spirit force that the Hindus worship because they are practicing the same mystery religion. And so that's number one. But let me show you number two. Not only do they begin with the mantra, the Om, but they also achieve a hypnotic state. You will see that these people, when they are listening to that music, they actually trance out. A hypnotic state is defined as being detached completely from any outward environment and completely absorbed by an inner experience. What happens is, the mantra begins and that excites this power within them so powerfully that they become completely detached from the outside world altogether. And in some cases you'll see them sitting on the street corner having an experience and people can walk right by them and it won't disturb them. They won't even know you're there because something so powerful is happening inside of them that they're completely detached from the outside world. Now, when the Holy Spirit works in people's lives, it makes you sober. It does not cause you to trance out. The working of the Holy Spirit does no such thing like that, not biblically. And the next thing I want you to see is that they achieve this hypnotic state, and in some cases, drug usage is involved. And so what I want to do, I just want to put like an asterisk here uh, just to let you know that that is not always the case with every religion. But I want you to understand that in history, it was very common for practice practitioners of mystery religion to use a potion or a drink or a brew that would have been created by the yogis, the sages, and the shaman. And oftentimes this brew or this potion would assist the practitioners in this religion and their desire to create a spiritual experience for themselves. And this potion was called many names like the nectar of the gods and in India it was actually called the Soma but if you go over to like a Persian culture it was actually called Homa with an H. And the contents of this potion would vary wildly but it was usually something along the lines that contained like poppy, it would contain cannabis, ephedra, and sometimes it included saffron, which is an aphrodisiac that is raised and grown in the Middle East. There's also evidence that indicates that psilocybin from mushrooms was used in this potion as well. 
Throughout history, people have practiced mystery religion, and the thing about them that I've always found to be odd was that these people never say that the Bible is not true. They practice mysticism or magic or whatever, and then they look at the miracles of the Bible and they say, well, yeah, we believe that that happened, sure. But the difference is they give the credit to not the Lord. They give the credit to, like, an experience. We did a ritual, and because we did this ritual, this person was able to do this. Oftentimes they will give credit for like dreams and visions to this mystery religion process that we're speaking about. They'll say like Ezekiel saw his vision because he was doing mushrooms. Moses saw the burning bush in the wilderness because he was on the same drugs that we're on and we saw the same thing. And that's always interesting to note. And really if you go back into this mysticism and like these paintings that are done, a lot of people, a lot of mystics throughout history have given credit for these miracles to mushroom trips. I wish I was joking, but this is actual fact. This is what they believe. Now, in my research of this, there was a kind of a, a road that this went down that really surprised me, and it was in the video game industry. Now, all of us know who Super Mario is, and I just, I remember many times as a kid thinking in the back of my mind, what does the mushroom mean in this video game? Well, in this context, it means exactly what you think it does. It has to do with drug use. Of course, the Super Mario franchise came out in the 80s, and the man who created it was named Shigeru Miyamoto. And somewhere around 2005, he gave an interview with Business Week, and he gave this quote, Mario ended up being too big, so he shrank him. Then we thought, what if he can grow and shrink? How would he do that? It would have to be a magic mushroom. Where would a mushroom grow? In a forest? We thought of giving Mario a girlfriend, and then we started talking about Alice in Wonderland. So that's where the idea of the princess came from. This was born out of, like, mysticism and drug culture. And so when he gave that quote, it kind of sent the world kind of a buzz. And in 2009, he gave another interview in which he gave this quote. Some time ago, I was being interviewed and I spoke about Alice in Wonderland. But it seems that there was some misunderstanding and it's since been stated that I was influenced by Alice in Wonderland. That isn't the case. It's just that there has always somehow been a relationship between mushrooms and magical realms. That's why I decided that Mario would need a mushroom to become Super Mario. And so you see in the mystery religion, the goal is to become a higher and greater version of yourself. Ultimately, the end of that road being that you become your own god. Well, the process of mystery religion, including drug usage, causes you to become a greater, higher version of yourself which is exactly what they're doing in the Super Mario games. You take the mushroom, you become a bigger, stronger version of yourself. And I find it also interesting that the very first enemies in the game are called Goombas, which ultimately are mushrooms themselves as well. And it's funny, the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. That means everything has been affected by this, even your beloved video games. They literally put magic mushrooms in this game and nobody caught it. And of course, the modern day equivalent of this would be LSD or ayahuasca. Now you see all these movie stars that are going to Costa Rica and they're taking ayahuasca tea and, and they're seeing things, they're having out of body experiences. That is a modern version of mystery of religion. You see guys like Joe Rogan doing this, LeBron James, you see Megan Fox. Many of your movie stars are a part of this. Why? Because they are practicing mystery religion, and this is how this works. You begin with a mantra, you achieve a hypnotic state, and in some cases, not, not in every instance, but in some cases, drug usage is involved. I believe in the book of Revelation when it refers to people that would not stop their sorceries, that it is referring to something along these lines. The mystery religion, in many cases, requires the usage of a substance to achieve the spiritual high that they so desire. And so once the mantra and the hypnotic state is achieved, sometimes through drug usage, what happens next is fascinating. What happens next is that the body experiences an energy release. And I would say that these three things together right here probably all happen at the same time. The body experiences an energy release. 
gnosis is what's experienced. And gnosis, of course, is heaven coming down and being caught between, as the song so aptly puts it. You step into the spirit realm at that point. You cannot tell what's physical and what's spiritual. You have crossed the line. You have gone into the third realm. And then also, because of these things, a higher consciousness is obtained. These three things together will result in these three things here. Now, this is the goal of mystery religion. For you to have a spiritual experience and without the mantra and without the hypnotic state and in some cases without the drug usage, you cannot accomplish this goal. And you see the difference between mystery religion and Bible believing Christianity is that mystery religion is based on experience, but Bible believing Christianity is based on truth. And faith doesn't require and experience. Now I want you to look at this last point with me for a moment and I want you to really get this because this is so very important. When a person has achieved the gnosis, when a person has done these rituals and gone through this, if you were to look at them from the outside in and say that person is having a spiritual mystery religion experience, what would that look like? Well, I want to show you a couple things here. All of this experience here results in a couple things. It can result in kriyas. Now kriyas, of course, are where the body shakes uncontrollably. You will see people that are practicing Buddhism that their spine will start to kind of go in a wave-like motion and their body will start just absolutely just shaking or convulsing. That is what happens when these people cross that threshold and achieve the gnosis through this process. Another thing that happens is that they will experience dancing their body will begin to move, expresses itself in a dancing-like motion. The next thing I want you to see is that this always results in a euphoric emotional experience. These people will be crying. They will be exceedingly happy. Whatever it is, it does not cause you to be calm. It causes some sort of emotional upheaval. And this is why people are so addicted to it, because it makes you feel something amazing that you cannot feel without this religion. It sends you to heights unknown that you never thought were possible. Heights of happiness, heights of joy, heights of even physical pleasure in some senses. This is what it does. It takes you somewhere that you could not go on your own. And so the euphoric emotion is a very strong part of this. The next thing I want you to see is that it results in mudras. Now, if you will look at Hindu illustrations, you will see that people will be doing things with their hands, uh, little hand motions and such, that uh, they'll be doing things like this or things like that. And, and there's a number of different mudras. Well, what is, what is a mudra? What are they doing? Well, let me give it to you this way. If you were to watch like an anime, like Naruto, or maybe like a Lord of the Rings type thing, where you see people that are wizards and sorcerers, and they're moving their hands in such a way that they're casting powers, or even Dragon Ball Z, you'll see somebody who is using their hands to throw a fireball to somebody. That, in a sense, is a mudra. Remember, this is a spirit that you can invoke and you can control it. You can make it do whatever you want it to do. And so by moving your hands a certain way and by doing these, these movements, you can actually push this spirit energy into something. One example of that is martial arts. You see these people that are doing these things with their hands where they're waving their arms in such a way. Well, that's not necessarily, I mean, they're not in engaged in a fight at the time, so they're not blocking and defending, but they're moving their arms and moving their hands in a certain way. What are they doing? They are harnessing the chi or the key energy. And by the way, remember, this has multiple different names, but it's ultimately the same thing. They're harnessing the key energy, and then they're, when they punch, or they, or they hit you with the palm of their hand, or they kick you, they're putting all that energy into their hand or into their palm, and, and they're hitting you with that energy force, because this is a part of mystery religion. And meditation, if you'll understand that, is a requirement to achieve the hypnotic state so that you can learn how to practice this mystery religion and harness this energy. Another thing that I want you to see is not only does it have mudras, but tongues is actually very common 
in these circles. We understand the tongues in modern day charismatic world is not the tongues of the Bible. The tongues of the Bible was a sign gift. It was basically a man would get up and speak in Aramaic and there would be a guy there in the crowd who would speak a Germanic language and he miraculously would understand it in his own language. But you never see in the Bible where people are just speaking gibberish and they're under control of the Holy Spirit. But you do see this in the new age that people are under the control of this vril energy, this chi, this ether, this prana, and they speak in complete, out-of-control gibberish. Now I want to also challenge your thinking as well. The New Age people, when they have their meditations and they're playing their mantras, lots of times they will begin to do something called light language. And light language is almost identical to what the charismatics do when they are, quote, talking in tongues. We receive words that are not our own. it is complete gibberish. They call it light codes, or and, and basically all they're doing is just just going ha ba la ba la ba la ba la. It's it's nothing. It is confusion is what it is, but it is a fruit of going through the process of mystery religion. Now, the last thing I want you to see here, not only do they have tongues, but they have visions. They begin to see things that they have never seen before. Now, in the third Adam movies, we have oftentimes referred to the Marvel comic series of movies where people will be practicing mystery religion. And by the way, all the X-Men, all that stuff, basically is a form of mystery religion just being put in a, you know, like a really cool package to attract young people. Basically what it is is occultism with kind of a cool slant to it. But I want you to notice that you have people like Doctor Strange and Black Panther and others that they're having these visions, they're seeing into the future, or they're getting words of wisdom from outside sources. This happens oftentimes in these religions, but in churches today, you have people that are astral projecting, people that are going to the courts of heaven. You have people like Paula White claiming that she went to heaven and, and, and spoke to the Lord directly. All of this is a result of mystery religion. And by the way, I want you to notice this. Can I, can I, can I point something out to you on this chart? All of these things here, the, the kriyas, the mudras, the tongues, the, the visions, the euphoria, the dancing, I want you to put all these in a, in a church context and see all those things happening. But I want you to understand the foundation of all of these experiences, I'm going to draw a line right here, is the mantra. When I warn you about music in churches, I am not arguing style. I am arguing religion. You have to understand 
Brother Spencer is not just some fuddy-duddy legalist who's out there trying to make sure that you're not listening to John Cooper music just because I'm a legalist or a pharisaical person. I'm warning you against a mystery religion. And all of this stuff that is happening in churches is happening because these people are going through this process of a mystery religion. And it all starts with an om. I, I could put it to you this way. It all starts with that right there. The third Adam series is designed to warn you against a false spirit that is working in the lives of people. And if I, I, I'm telling you, I have poured my heart and soul into this. I have warned you over and over about this. I have told you that this is not good. I have told you that this is from hell. I have told you that this is something that is demonic and satanic and it will ruin your family. It will ruin your soul. It will take you away from God. I have warned you about this over and over again. I have told you everything that I know. I have poured everything that I have into this and I want you to know that this is from hell. This is the most wicked thing imaginable. This is mystery religion. It's wickedness. And it's all based on that, a mantra, an om, and all the things you see down here, all the things that you see down there. All of that is based on the fact that you people are communing and fellowshipping with Satan. You're communing and fellowshipping with a doctrine of devils that is brought to you by a seducing spirit. I warned you. I told you not to go this way. And it's time that you heed the warning.